Hello, bon, bonjour Jérôme. Hello. Bonjour. Bienvenue. Alors, il y a une chose qui est importante, c'est qu que vous, vous ayez bien le, le statut d'hôte pour partager les, les PowerPoint. En fait, dans mon cas, je n'ai pas préparé de PowerPoint. Donc, euh, ce sera encore plus pratique. Non, non, ce sera, ce sera plus pratique. Euh, voilà, je, je, je te précise quelque chose, c'est qu'on on, l'enlèvera après, mais en fait, l'enregistrement a déjà commencé à tourner. Dès la première personne connectée, voilà, on avait programmé la session Zoom pour qu'elle euh, enregistre. Et euh, voilà, si tu es d'accord, on a créé une chaîne YouTube qui sera poussée par les réseaux sociaux après. Euh, L'intervention voilà, sera mise en ligne et euh, partagée avec, euh, avec cet outil. Tout à fait, oui. So, welcome everybody. We will uh, start in uh, one minute and then we will let, in, in the flow of the discussion, we will let people uh, uh, enter. So, what, what, what time is it? Uh, are you in Can Canada? Yes, I am in Canada. So, I'm actually in the province of Saskatchewan, so that's um, not too far from the Rocky Mountains. That's how far west we are. It's actually 8.30 in the morning here. Okay. So I managed to, I managed to, to join for the whole previous this, 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 this session as I was getting my children ready for, for, for their own day, so. Okay, great. And uh, thank you again for, for, for joining us. So, Uh, let's start. I'm uh, extremely happy, pleased, and, and honored to welcome uh, today Professor Jérôme Melançon from uh, University of Regina. Uh, we have had this uh, opportunity uh, this afternoon to talk about Merleau-Ponty several times. In the previous uh, Dauphine Phenomenology workshops, it's also a name that, come, that came several times, uh, but I think we have rarely encountered the political Merleau-Ponty, and uh, maybe it's a uh, wrong intuition, but I guess that this time we will have uh, an opportunity uh, to meet this political Merleau-Ponty. And uh, I wanted to say a warm thank you to Jérôme Melançon because uh, if I understand correctly, you uh, partly improvised, developed kind of a tailor-made reflection <laughs> Uh, in the context of our workshop and uh, the topic of uh, the commons and the experience of commons. So it's also another reason to say thank you again. Uh, so uh, Jérôme, we look forward to knowing more about uh, your research and the connection you will make visible today about uh, uh, phenomenology, Merleau-Pontian phenomenology and, and commons. Good, thank you. Um, I know it's the end of your day for everyone. Um, it's been a long and a very interesting day, if I can uh, tell from the last uh, session I was able to attend. I hope you all had the, move, the chance to move around a bit since the last uh, session. I certainly won't feel um, um, slighted if you decide to get up and move about a bit as I speak. Um, uh, just a few thoughts from the last session as I um, listen here. Um, this invitation has led to a great discovery. Um, Uh, I wasn't aware of the kind of work you were all doing. I'm finding it very, um, very interesting, very uh, useful as well. Um, I'm currently working on organiza organizational logics within social movements and francophone community organizations across Canada um, in the minor minorities settings like uh, here where I am um, from a phenomenological perspective. So I know I'll have a lot to gain from reading all of your work. Um, today, I did what I'm trying to avoid generally, which is writing a text to be read, a script, if you will, uh, without a PowerPoint. Um, I tried to make this easy to follow, knowing it's the end of your day, um, but the topic remains technical. Um, I'm a trained philosopher. I tried to remain humble here and present a paper in that spirit. Um, I hope it will be useful to your uh, pursuits for sure. Um, I want to thank the organizers of the workshop for inviting me. Uh, for allowing me to uh, return to this question of the common, um, onto which my previous work on democracy had opened to the point of actually forcing me to leave aside that, that uh, the book I was planning and start all over uh, because there was um, just too much to be done in this uh, area. So this invitation to present some of Malapont's concepts and ideas 
also brought this paper into being and shaped it. Um, but I wanted to address two dangers that I see in recourse to Mel Ponty. Uh, the first one is the danger of a direct approach to the commons from his philosophy. And the second one is a focus on the body and ontology that leaves aside uh, practice and action, or a reverse focus for that matter. So I share with uh, Dardot and Laval uh, in their book, uh, Kummer, um, this uh, concern regarding naturalism and a focus on practice and action. Uh, yet I find that there may, this major contribution to the study of the commons uh, in Kummer uh, inexplicably misses Meloponzi, um, inexplicably because of the references to Sartre in the Critique of Dialectic Reason that uh, draws so much from Meloponzi, and uh, the reference to uh, Castoriadis' work as well, which owes a lot to him too. Also because of his development of the notion of institution. So my hope today is to delineate and restrict the commons as a matter of mediation and praxis. Um, to, to limit the scope of this paper, I cut it down significantly from what I had uh, write, written um, at first. Um, I'm trying to set limits for taking the commons uh, without fully engaging in the, in the field. Uh, so more specifically, I'll approach the commons on the basis of and in distinction from the notion of generality and now upon his work. So with these precautions in mind, I'll turn to the question of generality, which will lead me in the first of three loops through Malpons' work. The second loop through uh, will be an exploration of the meaning he gives to private and public life, uh, far from those we find in liberalism around those concepts. While the third loop will interrogate the meaning, praxis, and production take for Malpons. I'm uh, speaking of loops here, insofar as Malpons' posthumously published uh, writings form a circuit uh, and moving through them can give different results depending on the selection of themes and moments in the evolution of his thinking um, in texts that were never meant to be published. So the first two loops will be quick explorations rather than full explanations. And I'll be happy to share the draft uh, paper uh, if anybody wants to have further discussion around the ideas that the organizers were hoping to hear about. So for the first loop around generality and flash, um, phenomenology, seeks to achieve generality. Right? Its value as a philosophical approach, the value of its method, um, depends on its generality, which at least for some phenomenologists like Melo Ponzi, is located outside of the opposition of subjectivity and objectivity. Through processes like the epoche and reduction, through imaginary variation in the uses of cases from experience, through a description of the depths of experience, Phenomenology seeks a balance between lived experience and universality. So generality is neither subjective nor objective, located neither in the subject nor, uh, nor outside of it. It's at once particular and universal. It's tempting to describe it as what is shared by, shared by human beings. It's tempting to see it as what is common to human beings. And in developing a philosophy of the commons, it's tempting to draw on this generality as what well is common, uh, and so indicates human subjectivity, collectivity, or intuition into being. This temptation is even greater when we're reading Mel Ponce's work after 1951, where one of his concerns is to describe the generality of human existence, where generality is not merely a matter of method, but a feature of the body, which blurs what modern ontology sets as its limits. And notably, uh, the distinction between self and other, um, shifting the boundaries between us. Generality is, for Mel Ponzi, our condition, at once natural and historical. Um, so it's tempting to do all these things, and I'll argue that we shouldn't. In his essay, Man and Adversity, uh, that you'll find in Signs or Sing, uh, Mel Ponzi outlines a movement through generality that focuses on some of its closely interrelated and indivisible aspects. First the body, then consciousness, other people, language and expression, politics, and family history. This movement supposes a rejection of the distinction between these terms, not as a matter of principle, but out of faithfulness to experience. In the context of this movement of thinking, Meloponzi takes a radical stance on intersensitivity. No matter a matter of observing and reaching others, of, um, no matter a matter of sharing with others, it becomes an aspect, an aspect of subjectivity, which is also always already intersubjective. 
these subjectivity and intersubjectivity are an aspect of intercorporeity, which in turn depends upon the movement of the one into the other, what he calls the in and ender, uh, that is at once empathy and intentional transgression. So all these concepts, um, he explains, point to a topology of the flesh. The flesh is the element within which perception and behavior take place. Uh, the flesh is elemental, he tells us. Uh, it's a fabric that is infinitely reversible, folded upon itself by the movements that take place within it, where dimensions brush against one another. In this way, the ideal is aligning for the material, meaning is the understanding of the voice or of the text, and the ideal carries the material as much as the material carries the ideal. One moves into the other because each is porous. So others appear in the flesh of the world, now Ponce explains, and in trying to understand ourselves, we pull with us the fabric of the sensible world and others with us. Others are my twins. They participate in the same flesh. They are ha hunted like me by the sensible. Yet at the same time, we are absent from each other, absent in each other, we remain separate. So flesh does not mean in, in differentiation. It doesn't mean that we are all the same or all alike. The reversal into one another is only ever imminent. It doesn't actually ever take place. We never actually take on the, the perspective of the other, even though we might come close to it. So from this very hurried description of the flesh I'm giving you here, it should already be clear that to understand intercorporeity, we must not begin with consciousness, but rather with the sensible as something in which we take part. Now, Ponzi suggests this possibility to, through two rhetorical questions, uh, both in the visible and the invisible. Um, this generality that makes up the unity of my body, why would it open up to other bodies as well? And um, uh, why uh, wouldn't synergy uh, also not exist between different organisms if it is possible within each? Donc, cette généralité qui fait l'unité de mon corps, pourquoi ne l'ouvrait-elle pas aux autres corps? Et pourquoi la synergie n'existerait-elle pas entre différents organismes si elle est possible à l'intérieur de chacun? So the opening of the body's generality to other bodies can be understood as a synergy between bodies that's analogous to the synergy within a body, within the different organs and um, ways of perceiving within the body. Um, there's a unity of the body which opens up to other bodies, uh, and this is what Merfonsi calls the body schema. There's a synergy within bodies that resembles uh, the synergy among organs, and this is the movement that Merfonsi calls praxia. Uh, these concepts of the body schema and praxia, uh, you'll find them mostly in uh, his course notes. I have the books right here, but yeah, in the, the, his first uh, course at the College de France, um, the sensible world the, um, and, the, and the world of expression in Brand Smith's translation or Mon Sensible et Monde d'Expression. Um, so this concept of body schema and praxia originally account for self-consciousness, for behavior and for expression. They also implied that there is no self-consciousness, no behavior, no expression without others understood as part of each of these movements. So other people are not objects of consciousness. We do not arrange our behavior around them. We do not direct our expressions at them. Instead, the elaboration of each of these movements already includes others. So this is the famous I can or je peux, with which Meloponsi replaces the I am of self-consciousness. Uh, movement, behavior, action, that is praxis, um, always involved the totality of the body in all its dimensions and its entire relation within the world. So praxis, as Mel Ponce explains, goes beyond action. It at once mo uh, mo motivates um, and um, is what is produced. It is pre-adapted to its situation and adapts to its specifics. It's a projection of the whole person within the milieu and the world as a horizon, and it incorporates it uh, as its background, um, a, a gnosis or a theory, he explains. So through the body schema, the body is inserted in space as what creates any spatial references. 
It has an intersensory unity with communication and spontaneous translation between tactile, visual, auditory schemas, and so on. And it is a relation to what the body is not. It is, as no policy writes, a certain way of assimilating the world, of identifying with it, such as in their voices, a certain way of assimilating others and of identifying with them. So when we speak, we are present to others and others are present in our speech. In other words, the body schema is really what our body is to us. It is the lived body as an open system. Now, Ponce uh, transforms uh, Husserl's notion that consciousness is always consciousness of something. The body schema is essentially an attitude towards something, an opening towards goals, a background for a praxis. The central idea here is that intercorporeity is not a matter regarding organic bodies, but rather lived bodies, body schemas. Um, these schemas in incorporate other schemas. They are imbricated into each other. So there is an uh, in an end of, of uh, body schemas, a movement of one into the other. Just as there are intrasensorial equivalences within a body, from touch to vision, for instance, there are intersensorial equivalences between bodies. Our corporates haunt each other. My body is organized in a schema that already includes other schemas. An awareness and knowledge of the ability for movement, for uh, visuality, for tactile uh, feeling in others that are just as present to itself as its own ability. We already understand that others can do everything we can do. So each body assumes um, the body schema of the other um, interjects the other into its own schema as a co-body, projects itself into the body of the other. Each body has its own modulation of human corporeal uh, generality, which is also a modulation of the generality of the world. Generality is not the same in every body in that it presents itself through a typicality that is different for each, that, um, it, uh, that each uh, body styles uh, in its own way. The generality of the body and the generality of the world are both anchored in the body schema. This generality, what is shared but manifests itself and is manifested differently for everybody, um, is what the concept of flesh attempts to illustrate. Now, Ponce writes in his reading notes for the visible and the invisible that my flesh is the particular case of the flesh of the world. And in the notes for the being and world manuscript, which uh, Saint Aubert uh, uh, quotes, the flesh of the body is a part of the flesh of the world, yet condition of this flesh. So now that I've completed this first loop through Mel Ponce's work, um, I could try to connect this notion of generality to the commons. But generality is not commonality. We can see this distinction um, in this account of flesh and body schema. Now, Ponce focuses on our presence to the world, our co-presence to others, our opening onto the world and others. Generality stands as a background, regardless of what we do. It's not the origin or the end point of a praxis. It carries a praxis and is carried within it. So we modulate generality, the flesh, through our praxis, and each person has its own style of bringing it about. We don't have generality, or anything we've discussed so far in common, because that would mean that we could not have it in common, even if it were wrongly or unjustly. As a result, we don't yet quite have enough to think the commons. And since the relationship to others and the uh, and then there, the one into the other uh, with them are not immediate, we need a concept of mediation, as well as a didactical interplay between these mediations and our praxis. Um, where praxis modulates mediations and mediations limit our possible praxis. So we'll, I'll do a second loop from Mel Ponce's work here uh, around the ideas of private and public life. So Mel Ponce explains that simultaneity or synchronicity is a mixing with others, a co-inscription within being. This is in the visible and the invisible. Others emerge beside me as perceiving the same being and not in front of me, not as, not as a part of my spectacle. They are not other selves because that would make them the same as me. There's more to others than what I can perceive or know of them. So the lives of others, Mel Ponce warns us, are a forbidden experience. 
And this deficiency, this lack in my perception, where I can't actually reach in them, is what makes them other. Alterity is the power of others to be another centering um, of being, a power to decenter me, a possibility of a different access to being that's already inscribed in being. And there's something of others to which we do have access, although never immediately. Public life is shared with others, and it's the realm where we are traversed by the same institutions, by language, for instance, where we are not sure exactly who begins and accomplishes what actions. We're not sure exactly where ideas and actions originate, but there's a flux that not only carries all of us, but intermixes all of us. Nothing of what we do is complete. In speech and in action, there are only relays where one expression takes up another and continues in a slightly new direction, no matter with whom it are originated. But like much in Alphonse's philosophy, his conception of private and public life does not allow for binary or dualistic thinking. In the work of art, for instance, the production of the work has first and foremost an effect on the life of the artist, on the private life of the artist. What the writer writes transforms her, which means that she could no longer write what she has already written. The painter creates systems of equivalences in each work, um, which she will only recognize once the painting is finished. We thus see an, an internal, private institution at play in the work of art, which has to do with the artist's relation to herself, to the world, and to others as far as generality and simultaneity are concerned. Yet artistic production is also a public interaction with others. In a note to this development, Malponsi adds, action on others would indeed already be public life. This is in Malponsi's uh, course notes on institution and facility uh, from 54, 55. Um, what we could take this vague idea um, in my, many the directions, while, while we could take it in many directions, here, Melaponti is commenting on the action of the artist and her work on others. Painting and writing are a deliberate and conscious relation to public history. They consist in taking up ways of painting and writing developed by others and taking up an inherited task. The personal institutions of painting and writing each take up a different public institution, which is itself transformed as works of art have effects on others whose artistic practice is also transformed. The public appears here as a collective endeavor present in the individual work and which exists only through individual works, but nonetheless can be seen in the succession and interrelations of these works. Each individual work of art emerges at once from personal and public life, participates in both at once. Public life depends entirely on personal life. So what we might call the interpersonal and the historical, that is respectively the private and the public, are not opposed, and one does not correspond to the other as Marxism suggested through the concept of base and superstructure. Each personal invention is a way in which history subsumes, subsumes itself. Malponsi even suggests that the personal is a matter of depth and the collective be, uh, would then be superficial. This comment should not be misunderstood. Depth is not more essential, more fundamental than surface. Rather, depth in Malponsi's work is a reference at once to Gestalt psychology to the study of perception and to Husserl's genetic phenomenology. It would be enough here to say that the personal or private is the background against which the collective or public appears as a figure, as a way to live the personal. It should be clear then that personal life is not the life of consciousness, that it's not private in the privative sense, in the sense where it can only be held by, by one person at the exclusion of others. The logic of institution takes us elsewhere than this privative life of self-consciousness that Malponsi opposes, this the Cartes um, Cartesianism that he opposes. The subject is both instituted and instituting, rather than constituting or constituted. There's no sense of an, an institution as an outlined, defined collective organization, and the state is mentioned only insofar as it would be a dead institution. The state is an institution only according to the letter, letter and not to the spirit of institutions. It is an attempt at stifling the creativity inherent in institutions. Indeed, from a Ponzi, institutions are these events of an experience that endow it with durable dimensions, 
in relation to which a whole series of other experiences will have meaning, will form a thinkable succession or, uh, or a history, or still the events which deposit in me a meaning, not as a vestige and a residue, but as a call to a succession, a demand for a future. So the, the movement of institution, this demand for a future, is that it wants to conserve, to take up, and to exceed what others have done and what, what we have done ourselves, to add to it by focusing on one of its possibilities, to give it a new orientation, which makes it meaningful to us and to others, and opens it again to new orientations. It shows how we have a public relationships with others, which exceeds our private simultaneity and gives it specific forms, so cultures, a public relationship which emerges against the background of the private. So here we can better understand what Malpensi means when he suggests in the visible and the visible um, that being is a matter of intersections, that it is a matter of perspectives, of views, of acts brought together and placed in solidarity with each other by the sensible and historical world. While others remain in most ways inaccessible to, to me, what I see and do remains tied to what they see and do. In institutions, we find a, a different kind of generality. The atmosphere of the sensible and historical worlds, of the corporeal, of the past, where everything is a variation and a difference from the same being. This co-implication of perceptions and acts is transversality and not transcendence or intemporality. So, this is, so there is a flesh of history, Malponsi tells us, just as there is a historicity of being. There too, there is a transformation of the private into the public, a transformation of events into mediations. So finding ourselves within speech, within nature, within the flesh as element, is not equivalent to, to deciding, together or not, what to do with them. Here the distinction between speech and language in relation to institution is illuminating. Speech is part of our generality, while language, a language, is something groups of people have in common. It is an institution. In the first look through Malpons' work, Focus on Flash, um, I looked at praxis as projection into the world and introjection of the world as pre-adapted and as adapting to a particular milieu. In this second loop, um, I, I tried to explain that this praxis with, which emerges from generality is implied by and itself implies the praxis of others, that it adapts it and is pre-adapted to the praxis of others. So we, we remain here within generality, but it's a generality of a different kind that goes beyond private life the body schema, which is also an interbody schema, which is a private life, towards public life, where we take up the actions of others and offer our own actions for them to take up, where we could see something like a historical schema. These are the mediations that Malpensi calls institutions, which, makes it, which make it possible for praxis to be pre-adapted, not only to being in its generality, but also to a specific milieu and specific other people. So now I can do a third loop through um, his work around the notions of production and institution. So this may be, may be a bit more interesting for the kind of work you're, you're doing more specifically here. <clears throat> so Malponti points out that institutions are norms for praxis. Institutions mediate insofar as they orient our praxis, they orient our activities or action, perhaps what he once called behavior. One aspect of this praxis is what, in his, in his uh, 1960 course, Husserl, uh, Husserl at the Limits of Phen Phenomenology, he calls production or Fernzugin. Um, he distinguishes production from perception. Production belongs to activity as a capacity to reactivate activities from the past, uh, while perception belongs to passivity. Past production does become passivity, that is a, a matter of remembrance, something that can be recovered. The past experience of production is lived again in its renewal, in a reproduction that flows from the original production. But the same goes for the productions of others, which can also be recovered. Reproduction indicates an awareness that the new production is in many ways identical to the original production. 
they are identical to this addition of the that re to what has been recovered of the past production. They are identical in that the same ideal products result in the two different productions. Lamponti says that the spiritual product product is numer numerically one. Production is the recognition of an activity by an activity. An activity that, that draws on passivity on what has been perceived and sparks a possibility of recovery. It only takes place as we act, as we do something. It's not, uh, it's not intellectual. A past production can thus be recovered by being reactivated, reactivated reproduced more faithfully than not, or by a renewed understanding and a co-understanding. Um, institution is what takes place as we produce and relate to past production. In its reactivation, institution is always somewhat beside the past institution. It's a re re repetition of the style of the past institution, but um, through new actions and new results. New productions, even though they re reproduce past productions, um, allow to reach or achieve the same product by taking up the style of the past productions rather than repeating them motion for, for motion. It cannot reactivate the entire meaning or movement of past productions. So in these four dense pages of course notes on Husserl at the limits of phenomenology and throughout that course, we find another view of our inscription in, in being, of our co-presence to being. Ideality is an invisible, which holds the visible together, a pivot. Ideality emerges within language, at the hinge between me and the other, as a function of this connection between us. It's not distinct from the relationship to another. Now, Ponce writes, this is still in the Husserl Adelance of Phenomenology, when I open myself to an other, an autrui, I make myself capable of ideality. And when I open myself to ideality, I make myself capable of reaching the other in the uh, production, in the um, uh, Being can thus be understood as co correlative to speech, the ver vertical aspect of being, not the being of perception, but the being of temporality and history is the being of praxis. In this being, in the traditions we carry in our praxis, we participate in an internal humanity, we are one in the other, in Ananda. Um, Nampansi writes, we are men precisely in that we always aim for a unicity through the thickness of our lives, in that we are gathered around this unique interior where no one is, which is latent, veiled, and always escapes us, leaving in our hands th uh, truths as traces of its absence. So here again, we find through production, praxis, institution, the being of lack, which is not only outside of us, not only the lack of perception, the lack of presence of the other, but also inside of us, the lack of pieces of what we're reproducing. Now, Ponty moves through a series of propositions to present facets of this relationship to humanity. We have humanity. It is inside of us it as a dimensionality, a horizon, a style that precedes any person an opening to an absence to the world, a lack of the same style as us, a promise of uh, uh, Einfühlen or um, empathy, sympathy, uh, a co-humanity. We are of humanity, inside of it, within it as a horizon. We relate to others laterally as they are present beside us, relating to the same world. So praxis is thus directly tied to generality, but also emerges from it. So now that I've presented uh, what I take to be the central ideas in Mel Ponty's writings around intercorpority, intersubjectivity, and the flesh as they may relate to the commons, following the, the original invitation of the organizers, I can, go, I can go back to a question I heard in the workshop's organizers' request. How can we think about the commons from Mel Ponty's philosophy of the flesh? How can we move here from generality to commonality? Much of my reflections emerging here and there so far, I've rather had to do with whether this is possible at all. The ideas I have presented here have to do with my genuine curiosity regarding this possibility and marginally with my concern for the relation between ontology and politics. 
As a result, I turn to mediation as present in the concept of institution and praxis as present in production. So in, in spite of my skepticism, I did find a version of the same question in Melponti's 1961 study of Marx's 1843 um, critique of Hegel's phenomenology of right. This is in his course notes. So I'll have the English version again. Um, so there he explained how, according to Marx, the critique of philosophical speculation, which is an ideological justification for a political order in place, faces the danger of being immobilized in theory, as I am currently immobilizing you in theory. Um, there's the need for a praxis that brings it into the world in order to transform it. Yet this must be a praxis that continues philosophy, that realizes it. We can then ask what makes it possible for Melponti's philosophy of the flesh and of institution and production to have an effect on institutions and on the way productions take place. So here I'm trying to show how generality and commonality continue to be related even as they remain distinct. Melponti explains that a philosophical action must animate a historical movement which, we, which will realize them in concrete men and will make a society that's more advanced than those they have already achieved um, uh, so as to become a model for them. So a philosophical practice is a negating practice. It's not poiesis. It doesn't seek to achieve ends by any means. It isn't instead the whole of all means. It lies in the dialectical inter interdependence of means and ends. It is at once being and doing. It's a manner, a style, rather than having any ends at all. It has humanity as an end rather than having any specific end. It is a philosophy, uh, as Melchon said, right? a philosophy of car uh, carnal man. This carnal man, or l'homme charnel, and let us say uh, carnal beings, despite the pronoun to jump from man to humanity, um, this carnal being um, sends us back to the flesh. So praxis is defined in this context as non-fabrication of some result for example, of an apparatus of technical power, but rather a practice, uh, practice, a mode of historical existence, universal and fundamental. Uh, it's an action uh, that is to realize the philosophy of carnal beings, the philosophy that Melpontsi attempts to bring to expression. Um, this action, this philosophy must be an action for no particular interest, and so an action for nothing an action that does not aim at interests, but rather at what underlies them, an action that aims to transform the whole. A true sublation, so a true dialectic um, that doesn't end, goes beyond what is negated, does not conserve it otherwise. Um, such a philosophy that is also a praxis would be concrete and universal. It would refuse some things by agreeing to others. It would agree to things by refusing others rather than simply holding its own conviction within, conviction within itself. This philosophical praxis brings philosophy into human life as it takes place within law and within politics, within interactions and institutions, within non-philosophical praxis, its mutual production of and by objects and society. In other words, this philosophical praxis is a self-consciousness among things and alongside others. History, speaking here, history being in this sense, the very flesh of man. I'll pick up another thread that I had left aside earlier in order to offer a suggestion as to what this whole, this humanity might be. So coexistence is a central concern in Nalponsi's political philosophy. So whereas in our generality, we are co-present to the world, no coexistence is um, of itself guaranteed or excluded for the matter. This generality is always lived, experienced through a situation and through movements of institution. There is no difference between generality and institution. One cannot be isolated from the other. Um, we are instituted and instituting in the same movement of, institu of institutions um, in, in the way that we institute ourselves, our languages, our relationships to others, um, uh, our groups and collectives, our relationships to these various groups, to the land, to political regimes, and to economic and social systems. 
Institutions depend on our generality, what we already share, um, to bring us together or separate us. Institutions lead us to live according to the land and find teachings within it, or to arrange it according to our desires and seeing as holding resources for us to exploit. To do so, um, they depend upon our praxis and be motivated. As we read through Melpons' political texts, we see that our co-presence or intercooperality and intersubjectivity can be coexistence, or they can also be violence. Most of the time, they encompass both, and we participate in the same institutions quite differently depending on how they institute us, that is, depending on what norms they set for our praxis, where they situate us, whether they include or exclude us, empower us or dis dispower us. For these norms uh, frame different situations, reinforcing them and being repeated through them. Institutions cross uh, to create series of beings who are not to be treated different, uh, who are to be treated differently, who are allowed to do different uh, things. This is a racialization, for instance. Norms for praxis favor some aspects of human praxia over others or, and make others um, illegitimate. They attach to aspects of bodies felt to be salient, skin rather than hair color, for instance, they attach to families, to histories, to legal fictions. Within this conceptual and philosophical framework, what we call the commons or the common would be the result of a series of institutions related in some way to production and property. We are instituted and we institute in great part through a praxis that Lanfonts did not study. Economic production and relation to property occupied the greatest part of our day. They make up the greatest part of our praxis. I was very happy to hear uh, Francois' take on, um, on uh, ordinary capitalism. Um, different types of praxis, different stylizations of human production are legitimate based on a number of other institutions which attach themselves to bodies that are racialized, gendered, and classed, classified. They limit or expand what can be common within groups and across collectives. But what is truly common or not is the praxis that norms set out. If a praxis is a mode of historical existence outlined by institutions that act as its norms and make it possible to recover the productions of others, then we have a much clearer view of the commons. A Melopontian politics of the commons is not a turn away from interests to a politics of the flesh. It's not a turn away from particular interests to general interests either. Rather, it is a turn away from interests towards the praxis through which we pursue our interests and realize our values, informed by the facts of our generality, informed by our awareness of our intercorpority, intersubjectivity, and interactions. The awareness that we inflict upon us, ourselves, for instance, the wrongs that we inflict upon others, we suffer from the violence that others suffer from. What we have in common, what is properly speaking common, is what we do together. Now I can finally conclude and, and, and um, um, let's free you from this uh, talk. I want to uh, highlight a few consequences for the theories of the commons that can be drawn from this overview of the experience of generality and criminality we find in Montpellier's philosophy. Um, here I draw from Pierre Dardot and Christian Laval's work in Commer, uh, la Révolution au XXIe siècle, which offers a critical synthesis of the contemporary movements in favor of the commons. Um, evaluate their intellectual origins and future directions, and in most part draw on Proudhon, Marx, and uh, Kistoriadis for their original political pr propositions. I'm also considering the situation of indigenous peoples across the world, and more specifically those of Turtle Island, commonly called today North America. I am, after all, speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Nehewak, um, uh, Nakawek, uh, Ocheti Shekawen, uh, Oyate, uh, often called the Sioux, and the homeland of the Metis. Uh, where my presence is made possible through treaties, not only Canada, but also the traditional territories. That's important to take into consideration over here when we think about the, the commons. In the narrative presented by Dardou and Naval, the commons are a response to economic exclusion. The analogy with the problem of enclosures is telling. We are facing a privatization of resources that used to be more freely available. This prioritization draws a line between those who are able to pay for consumer goods that used to be simply goods, those who have access to wage labor, and those 
um, who do not have this ability and this access. In reading Mel Ponce, we can see that there's also a question of access to transforming how conception and production takes place and access to transforming institutions. So there's a further line that separates those whose lives are affected economically, either positively or negatively, and those who, in addition, can no longer live their lives and further their institutions. So these are indigenous peoples. Um, and we saw it in the earlier presentation around um, um, mangroves. Indigenous lives and institutions are tied to the land in a specific place to which access is becoming more difficult, either because of literal or legal enclosures or because of pollution and destruction. The privatization which the commons are meant to oppose also further expands the gap between these categories and those who now own these goods and control this, this access. A critique of the commons on these lines already exists in the work of indigenous scholars such as Glenn Coulthard and can be extended to some aspect of Gabriel Naval's work and political proposals. Melpontes does not help us think about the racial and colonial aspect of exclusions and enclosures, no more than Dardo and Naval do, even though both help us see the need for such an analysis. So there's an, an important common point between Melpontes and Dardo and Naval, uh, the problem of, the, of a passage from generality to commonality in Melpontes it was a problem of the passage from nature to the commons for our contemporaries. Dardo and Naval thus set out the important principle at play in, in my own talk here, just as we cannot understand the commons and norms for action by drawing on human nature or any other uh, nature, we cannot understand commonality as merely based in generality. Nonetheless, here we have two different, uh, two philosophically distinct uh, uh, responses. While Dardo and Naval jump into conventionalism in their staunch refusal of naturalism, taking custom and mutual, mutual obligation as the roots of the politics of the commons, Melaponti attempts to understand how the institutions that set out the possibilities for praxis relate to generality, to nature and being. By highlighting the interplay of mediation and praxis, he offers the path through which we can avoid drawing on nature or ontology to decide on human action, without falling directly into conventionalism. And here I'm, I'm perhaps being unfair to Dabu Naval. Yet um, they do alternate between setting up the nature of action itself, uh, so as to set up the commons as its necessary norm, and presenting these norms that are to guide action as purely conventional. So Melaponti's um, advantage here is that he, uh, he avoids the alternative and maintains one of the basic tenets of existentialism. Action will remain a matter of decision. Now, just about that. We can see based on his philosophy some of the conditions under which the commons can represent a shift away from neoliberalism understood as the ideological and policy matrix for a new appropriation. Just as Mel Ponzi suggests that we must give up a focus on the state, which has been central to the liberalism that, has, that was transformed into neoliberalism, but also to communism as its main alternative, we must also give up a focus on property. One institution cannot change all others. Instead, it is institution as a style of praxis that must be uh, our focus by transforming what activities of the past and of others are recovered and how they are recovered. We cannot start anew. Melopontis framework suggests that a genuine alternative to these possibilities must draw from institutions that are already in place or that can be recovered. A focus on production and on the style of praxis offers this alternative and signifies an approach to collective life, to coexistence, rather than a focus on property. In other words, it re represents a shift from what we might put in common, not to what we have in common, but to what we produce in common, to how we produce. A shift to a focus not to processes of production or even to means of production, but to the general style of production across a, the wide variety of human praxis. Thank you for your patience. I look forward to the time we still have for discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Jerome, with, for, for this presentation, which resonates a lot with uh, the event of this year, but also uh, the events of the previous year. Uh, maybe uh, let, let, let me start with uh, two, two questions. Uh, I found fascinating your use of the notion of generalité, 
generality. Uh, as far as I know the literature about commons, there are, let's say, two clans. The, the clans interested in universality, common goods, and another clan more interested in singularity, uh, claiming that a common, in a way, it's the community itself. Uh, collective activity creates the community, which is, at the end, a kind of common good in practice uh, for, for those involved in the community. Would you say that generality and the thesis you defended here is in a way a, a chiasmatic relationship between these two things? Is it a process in the middle uh, at the end? Uh, or would you position what you say to this two caricature of series of uh, commons? What I've seen in the literature on the comments that, that I've read, um, obviously, and as well versed in it as, uh, uh, as one of you here. Um, so I, I attempted to do something that now Ponty often does, which is to take um, two alternatives and say, well, let's refuse both. <laughs> let's, re let's reject mm -hmm. both in the end. So this is a, a rejection of the logic of singularity and uh, universality. Yeah, saying instead, we'll look at generality, what is present in both. So generality is, is sort of a background for both the singularity and uh, universality. Um, and it's, I believe, uh, um, both uh, possibly sensible to, s sensitive to um, anchored communities, specific communities and, and their, um, their actions, their, their interests, and to um, what can be put in common in a more universal way um without giving up either i suppose mm. it, it's trying to be that one way uh, i know there would be other questions but a, a second question just before the, moving to the other questions uh you, you, you quoted many things from marlo ponty the lectures the books the lecture of the college de france the books uh, there is maybe one thing that you did not stress uh, it's uh, the lectures about nature and its vision of nature as a soil, a ground uh, bearing us. In a, or, or would you relate what you said about generality to the vision of nature with a capital letter as uh, conceptualized by nature, uh, by Merleau-Ponty? Is it a natural continuity of it, uh, generality? The courses on nature are, are difficult. Um, I find them um, in some ways uh, cut up from a lot of what he says in other courses, um, but it, it isn't enough for him to start over. And so a lot of those insights end up being passed into being. And when Mapon talks about nature, there's not a, a huge difference between nature and being. Um, there's a lot of, of um, uh, proximities there. Um, nature is, I suppose, one of the facets of being from our point of view. So I didn't get into that so much. Uh, I think it will be uh, important in approaching the commons to, uh, to understand this notion of nature. Um, but I think there we have the same dynamics of, of uh, generality, where nature is to use the immediate the, the central bias concept, um, it um, upholds us, uh, uh, the idea of portance in French, we agreed that we'll translate it by, by uh, uh, upholding. So nature upholds us, but we also uphold it. Um, it's um, transversal and, and we are part of it, it's part of us. Um, it's not transcendental, it's not universal. Um, it's not outside of us either. Um, uh, and I think um, there's a lot that the philosophy of the commons can gain from that approach to nature because it's not outside of us, it's not separate from us. And I did touch on, upon that very briefly, um, but it's not something that's outside of us for us to just exploit. Um, although we have in ordinary capitalist life, um, in the ordinary capitalist attitude, uh, or this new natural attitude, um, um, approached in that way. Um, so wherever to, I guess, paraphrase what he says about uh, violence to other people in the note of Machiavelli, whatever harm we bring to nature, we also bring upon ourselves um, um, because of this generality. 
Right? It's not just that we need nature as an outside thing, but that we are um, traversed by it. Okay, so I think there are probably two other questions by uh, Pierre and uh, Gazi. Pardon? Yes, Pierre. Um, what about uh, you? Did, did you mention? Did you, did you have any connections to the the, uh, the creative, the artist work, and the commune, the commune, uh, or la creativité? Uh, did that? Uh, you were not touching upon that directly, huh? or is, maybe it's not so important in in your investigation. No, I think it is really important. Again, uh, I tried to, uh, the, this talk is impossibly um, general. <laughs> and I was frustrated even as I was giving it uh, for that reason. Um, uh, as I was preparing it, I, I thought there's too many specific things to look at. So nature is one, art is an, another aspect to uh, continue on. Um, I think uh, when it comes to art um, and knowledge is another one that we could talk about too. Um, art um, does have that generality in terms of um, how we, we relate to art as we relate to any part of a sensible world, but we, there's also this commonality in the process of interacting with art. So the um, Malponti focuses on how artists relate to each other through the mediation that is the work of art. And so for him, what really matters is how the artist transforms himself, and it's always a him for him, um, how the artist transforms himself through his work, how other artists are then transformed, how they, they transform their own perception uh, in, uh, in their relation, in their appreciation, their understanding of that work of art, and then turn that towards their own prax uh, praxis. So past works of art or even present works of art that, that, that they, they see will then help them transform their own practices, their own creation of works of art. What he's less clear on is the role that has to do with non-artists, how our own perception is then affected by that. Um, so that's something I'm very interested in, in continuing, especially in relation to public art. We have controversies over monuments to be taken down, and there's a, a commonality here, right, of these public works of art that shape our perception of what is to be, um, what is to be celebrated as well as what is to be admired, what stands out aesthetically uh, pleasing and what should belong to all of us. Um, so I might go in that direction when it comes to the, the work of art, um, not only looking at um, the, the commons that is in the an artistic praxis, but also the commons in, in non-creative um, or I guess somewhat still creative uh, praxis of non-artists. Would, would, would you say that, that um, I mean, we've discussed uh, the idea, of, I mean, the subjectivity, objectivity problematic and, and, and uh, is, is the fight with, with or the tension with psychology uh, still present? Uh, I mean, th that's what comes out from my simple reading of, of Merleau-Ponty. And, and the second thing, is really generality a, a problem for him? Is, is, it, is it an issue? Is, is something that is, I mean, yeah. I, I don't think uh, it's a problem for him. I think it's an answer for him. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that, that does come up quite often in, in his, uh, his writing. And I think I'm, I am here, um, I guess, in trying to explain his work and interpret his work, maybe um, giving it a larger place than he does but I'm, I'm finding it in these different aspects of his work where we can talk about generality in relation to, to being rather than um, universality, for instance. So I do, I do think that that's a, an important part of, of his work um, that's transversal through it, starting with uh, the phenomenology of perception at least. Um, and then when it comes to psychology, uh, go ahead, if you want to follow up on that. No, 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 I mean, because I, another concept which is, I mean, preoccupying us since 
a decade is of course a singularity idea and and uh, and as as a concept but uh, which i don't think really is an issue in in his writing and and in the writing of that period the singularity i mean you don't there was not a felt need to introduce a, a concept of singularity instead of individuality and yeah there is some anachronism here no Oh, but I think um, singularity in his work might... Um, singularity, it does it uh, exist, yeah. singularity? Yeah, singularity, I think, um, um, doesn't make sense in the context of Melpons's work uh, because um, it would fall within um, the philosophy of consciousness that he opposes so much. Mm. Um, and um, the concept of singularity that's being developed now is quite different from this liberal individualism, quite different from this um, um, uh, closed upon um, mon monological subs subsistic uh, consciousness that he opposed, in great part um, because of the influence that Melpolsi has had upon um, philosophers of the, of the fallen generation, who have all tried to, to think beyond that, that trap. Um, so I don't think that, um, um, I think th there's a lot in the generality that I'm, I'm suggesting here that would work very well with these new uh, views of singularity. At least I'm hoping it could be helpful in uh, the developing uh, this, uh, this, this singularity. You certainly are. Thank you. I mean, you have mentioned psychology, so briefly, psychology is always an issue for Malfonsi. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we often see him as, or he's often shown as um, um, a close to Husserl, close to Marxism. We have to add Gestalt sense psychology um, as a third, um, um, uh, a third um, uh, influence, a third tradition to which he always goes back. Uh, so there's uh, an opposition to more psychology uh, in favor of some aspect of Gestalt and some aspect of uh, psychoanalysis. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Gazi, yes. I could quickly, I don't know if there's uh, time though. Uh, if there is just a minute, I was curious about one, um, one aspect which, uh, um, as, as Jerome noted, uh, overlapped a bit with uh, your uh, earlier talk, Fratois, uh, about the, um, the role of capitalism and the, how the active uh, the, the the idea of ex exploitation of the commons, um, and uh, my question was whether this active notion of commons as practice as a, a sort of I guess a labor in some ways, right? A sort of a sort of common activity. Whether that informs maybe some some notion of what would be the exploitation of the commons or the the uh, enclosure or appropriation of the commons. So so what would be the kind of political economic implications of that? rethinking of the commons. So it's kind of a broad question, but to, to dig into that overlap a bit. Yeah, so where I'm headed after this, uh, this uh, paper, um, I think, uh, I, I obviously that's a lot of, I, I agree that there's a lot of, of, um, of overlap there. Um, and it's interesting that he uses the word production um, and he takes that not from Marx, but from Husserl. And he reads Marx and it's at the same time, Right? Like this course on Husserl of, of phenomenology is almost contemporaneous with his course on Marx. And the point of this course on Marx, which he never finished because he died before it was over, um, was to do a philosophy of capital. So and when I read that, my head explodes. I think, why did it happen? <laughs> this would have been wonderful. Um, like much of the Melpons' later work. Um, but I think starting with capital, starting with um, not production in the very general sense that I'm using, but production as industrial production, production as um, this idealist uh, or this um, um, ideal production that we're engaged in um, uh, of the service industries, of the creative class and so on, um, I think um, would make all this a lot more concrete um, and will help us see exactly what we can shift. So instead of throwing it back to you, um, I had all of you in mind, what you seem to be doing around uh, management and work, um, to say, well, maybe there's something here in going back to how we take up 
past productions, how we take up, take up uh, past uh, actions, uh, the actions of, of others, how we make those possible, how we block off some of those actions because of capitalism, because of, it's no, because of how it shapes um, ordinary life, um, how it limits production to certain forms of production, certain forms of, of interaction. Um, so I'd be really eager to see what you all, all have to say about it. Um, I'm a lot less certain of where I would take it. It would definitely have a lot to do with um, the structuring of everyday life uh, by our work. I think it's inside I got from Gramsci at some point, it's been too long now, but that we are basically what we do for most of the day. Our, our everyday practice ends up defining us, so us intellectuals end up being defined by this intellectual work and that defines our relationship to sensory being even, whereas people who work physically for 10, 12 hours a day, and that's most of what they do, end up having a very different relationship to being into other people. Uh, so capitalism in, um, offers different possibilities to, to, to different people, but mostly shuts them off um, and creates privilege in that way. I would have just a last question, which may be a way to, to continue the, the, this debate. It's about the notion of dialectic that you, that you use. Uh, I, I did this test one time. If you look at the index of almost all the books of Merleau Ponty, there is a clear curve in this use. It, and at the end, it completely disappears. It's not at all pronounced in uh, Institution La Passivité, Le Cours sur la Nature, or uh, L'Oeil et l'Esprit, or Le Visible et l'Invisible. And I've always wondered if in his ontology, this idea is replaced by something else. Probably it's not chiasm. It's not really becoming, uh, it's a word you can pronounce, but it's much more connotated in, other, in the context of other ontologies. Uh, it doesn't use words like paradox. Uh, and I, I would be curious to hear you about that because you, you, you use in the, even the title of your, of your talk uh, included this, let's, let's call it a Marxist notion. And uh, in, in your opinion, has he replaced it by another notion or a phenomena in his later writings? One of the problems we have is that the courses on dialectics haven't been published. Um, uh, that there's that, someone who has transcribed them and is sort of sitting on that, and it's very yeah, unfortunate. It um, I've seen them. I actually went to the national library to to read it, and I didn't have the time coming from from here uh, to uh, actually learn Melpont's handwriting, which is atrocious, especially on on uh, uh, microfilm. Um, so he has this whole course on the history of dialectics, um, and um, he also takes it up in the adventures of the, the dialectics and then we find it in the visible and the invisible on the uh, in the notion of hyper dialectics um, and that's the sense that i'm using it and originally I, I wanted to have more of a focus on the this hyper dialectic relationship between mediation and praxis and um, it just became impossible a bit of way more than i could chew with an abstract in that title <laughs> uh, but um uh, the idea here is that rather than having a Hegelian or Marxist kind of dialectic where there is sublation and where uh, there's always a conservation of some aspects of the past, Merleau-Ponty talks about hyperdialectic. So there's not, first of all, there's not a third term. There's always um, this back and forth between terms that never ends. There's never an actual synthesis. Um, there's always different people taking up these relationships in different directions. So, whereas the Hegelian Marxist model means that there's, you know, thesis and antithesis, synthesis, and we move through these uh, throughout human history, now Ponzi has um, uh, this idea that there's always many theses all at once, each antithetic to all the other ones, um, each going against each other all at the same time, each transforming each other at the same time. So it's this it's an infinite network of interrelation that never, that always changes everything, that never ends, never gets up higher, uh, but also never stays static. Um, um, it's, so it's this hyperdialectic that I have more in mind where you have these two terms that constantly change each other, um, are in constant relation with each other, 
uh, and that open up always leave new uh, possibilities. So um, I think I would change my title uh, when it comes to a, uh, <laughs> to a uh, publication. But I think this notion of dialectic is really important um, because when Ponte doesn't keep that Marxist uh, sensation. And um, the main um, uh, clue here is in the preface to science, I believe, where it talks about uh, what Marx was missing was the idea of mediation. So when you add mediation to dialectic, you have this hyperdialectic. Um, so that that, that um, part of the visible and the invisible is really helpful in thinking about historical relationships and historical change. Um, history as this part of being or um, generality, uh, because it's, um, uh, it teaches us hu humility, right? that there's not one way that will take over everything else. That I love like what, um, Actually, I find a lot in uh, Eric uh, Owen Wright here, in his view of capitalism as simply a system where capitalist institutions prevail alongside all the other ones, right? Um, so it's giving up a lot of Marxism. Uh, there is still feudalism, there's still slavery. We know there's more slaves today than there ever was. So that's still around, but it's still capitalistic, mostly because capitalist institutions are the most important, the most present. There, there's more of them, they have a, a larger power. But everything else is still there too. And they're still feeding into capitalism. Uh, capitalism is still, is still feeding uh, upon them. There's also socialist institutions that are present. Um, a lot of what's uh, taking part that um, commons uh, theorists and um, thinkers are, are looking at. So that, that's all interacting with each other at all times and creating the overall system. And so there's always flaws always um, these lacks within any system that can be taken up to lead to something else. So that goes back to a lot of what I was saying, but let me uh, um, um, presenting it a bit, a bit differently. There's always things we can take up that exist that offer different futures. Thank you very much, Jérôme. This would be great concluding words. Uh, un grand merci, merci beaucoup. Merci. pour cette euh, conférence <laughs> with la pompa uh, so you will receive uh, next uh, week more news from from all of us yes it's good that we all become some faces at the end <laughs> uh, that we make uh, all visible ourselves <laughs> hello um, so thank you again Jérôme. thanks to all of you uh, i think it's been a great intense uh, workshop uh, we will also come not only with uh, the record, the files about uh, the, the sessions, but uh, also with some project. We have started to talk with some of you about the topic of next year, which could be presence and co-presence in a world in crisis. Uh, Co-organize uh, again with some people at Dauphine and uh, other people in, in Sweden. So let's let, 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 uh, explore this uh, possibility further. And uh, we will also come back about two ongoing projects. The first project, some of you are already involved. It's uh, uh, at Cambridge University Press, Phenomenology and Organization Studies. We already published uh, a book with them based on uh, uh, a Dauphine Phenomenology Workshop that we organized about uh, experiencing the world of work. And it would be more something like a handbook so it's a work in progress. Uh, we will keep you uh, updated about this. And the last thing I wanted to mention, it's a special issue, which is in the third road of revision with a journal, and which should be connected with the topic of this workshop. Uh, it should talk about experiencing commons. There will be critical perspective, alternative perspective, but uh, what we will be expected, it's uh, papers, drawing, on phenomenological or post-phenomenological uh, perspectives. So you, you will hear from us soon about uh, these uh, three things. I wanted to say also uh, to conclude uh, a warm thank you to Geraldine uh, and Ellen who, is, uh, who did an amazing job uh, uh, in the background of all this because you guessed that it's a complex process with all these digital stuff and uh, yes, it's. Uh, it's not easier to manage that kind of event from far. It's much more complex than we expected. 
we would have loved to meet all of you in Paris. It would have been much better and the conviviality would have been different. Uh, so thanks a lot to uh, Hélène and uh, Geraldine and uh, have a great weekend and uh, I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Oh, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye.